from PRX. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and friends beyond the binary, it's time for the podcast who's here to bring you some bedtime cheer. Whether you're far or near, uh, nothing will be as it appears, and uh, or and nothing ever will has ever been clear. And of myself, I'll make a rear, all to put you to sleep and to keep you company. And if you're confused, you're in the right place because it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. Hey, everybody, Scoots, and we're doing a push uh, for our Patreon. We're trying to get our Patreon numbers back up to where they were last year. I know it's a tough time for everybody, but think about it. If you uh, had to pay for the podcast, uh, what if you had to pay a quarter an episode or 10 cents an episode? How many episodes do you listen to every single month? Uh, Could you consider, if you're in a financial position to do so, supporting the podcast at uh, $5, $10, $20 a month? Uh, could Could you do that? Are you in a position to support the show? You could do it annually, but I don't even know, like, so 10 cents a month, I don't know how many episodes it is. Would you support the show at five, 10, $20 a month? Uh, I guess this is, I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm caught in my own meander trying to pitch you on supporting the Patreon, but basically the pitch is if you listen to Sleep With Me on a regular basis and you're in a financial position where you could support the show at 10, $25 a month, or you could support it annually, you save, I think, 8% or one month uh, when you support the show annually. If you can do so, please consider doing so right now would be an amazing time to support the show. We're really at a crossroads because of, you know, everything that's going on in the world. We've lost a lot of patrons. We have a lot of patrons uh, that don't have uh, valid payment info. And I really need you to consider becoming a patron right now. And it's a great time to become a patron. We're just about to launch our Discord community. We've got tons and tons of amazing bonus content. We're doing fun community activities. So there's a lot of fun stuff going on. But the main reason uh, people support the show, patron after patron after patron whose people have been patrons since I started the Patreon is because they get so much out of the podcast. They love being a part of it, paying for something they get value out of versus all the other stuff you pay for you might not even use. So please consider it. Sleepwithmepodcast.com slash patron. Sleepwithmepodcast.com slash patron. Be a huge, huge help. Uh, and let's get on with the show. All right, everybody, it is time for the Sleepy Supporter Zone, one part of the podcast. And each year, it's where I pop my peas. If you please, I thank the listeners who supported the sponsors. Uh, let the sponsors know about it. Uh, that's how the show is here for you free twice a week is the people that support the sponsors tag the sponsors so they know their sponsorship's important and uh, they know people hear the ads. Uh, it's thank the listeners who supported the sponsors. Let the sponsors know about it. Elevated their support. So I want to thank Mary and Jeff. Mary supported Relief Band. Jeff supported Apollo Neuro, and they let those companies know about it. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Jeff. If you want to be a part of the Sleepy Supporter Zone, if you want a thank you video, fill out the form, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash sponsors, and be like Mary, be like Jeff. Uh, that's uh, the first part of the Sleepy Supporter Zone. The second part of the Sleepy Supporter Zone is you getting the support you need. If you're in extra need right now, there's links to resources you could connect with right now, including internationally, right in the show notes. It's also about being a part of community and positive change. Uh, so not just saying Black Lives Matter, not just saying stop AAPI hate, uh, not just saying support Ukraine, uh, but learning more, taking action. There's links to resources we could do that right in our show notes. And it's uh, part of positive change is taking action, uh, small steps uh, to create positive change. That's what we're doing over at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash midnight mission. I'd love it if you join us there for free. You could sign up uh, for our newsletter. You'll get live streams of our live shows. You'll get community Zooms where you can participate and ask questions for free. Uh, what could be better? You, you, you'll be a part of Positive Change, helping us build hygiene kits for people experiencing homelessness, uh, have fun with other listeners, hang out with scoots, all that for free and for Positive Change. Uh, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash midnight mission. Uh, oh, Mystery Bar, a lot of people help out on the show. Who are they? Posty post or some sounds like an earful. Wrote the theme song. Carl W. The Legend, Ashley, Kenny, Scotty, Jennifer, Eric and the team let us down, they're on the website, I am the mystery bar, I do the lullabies, yeah, I do commissions at JonathanMan.net, I'll write a song for you, any reason at all, you can tell me the story and I'll make it personal, 
You see the kindness shine straight on through when the listeners form their own Facebook group. Keith, Stacy, Sarah, Julie, and Jennifer. These are your moderators. Get support, dear Scooter, on Patreon. Buy the merch and support the sponsors. You can find anything you want at Sleep With Me Podcast. And we're so proud that we could dance. Rusty Biscuit, Lois, and I like banana. Leah does the transcripts. Thanks, Mystery Bard. I'm uh, signing up for our newsletter, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash midnight mission. And what do you say? We slow it down and get on with the show. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Uh, well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do or all you could do is get in bed, turn out the lights and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever is keeping you awake, uh, whether it's thoughts, you know, things on your mind that you're thinking about, anything you're feeling like that's coming up for you emotionally related to the thoughts or related to anything else or just unrelated that are just there. Uh, It could be physical sensations. It could be changes in your routine or the temperature is season. It could be other stuff. You know, there's a lot of other stuff uh, that could be going on. But whatever it is that's keeping you awake, I'd like to take your mind off of stuff and keep you company while you drift off. And uh, that's really what my job is, is to take your mind off of stuff and to be your friend, your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar cuz, your boar sib, your boar bestie, your boar bud. Did I say boar friend? That's kind of the most important one. But to be your friend here in the deep, dark night, the way I propose to attempt to do it is I'm going to try to create a safe place here by making a smoothing and padding motion, inviting you in. Then I'll send my voice across the deep, dark night. I'll use lulling, soothing, creaky, dulcet tones pointless meanders, and super superfluous tangents. And what that means is I'm going to go off topic. I'm going to get mixed up. I'm going to sound a little bit different uh, than something normal. There's nothing, this is definitely, If I don't like to use the word abnormal because it kind of is one of those words that has a little bit more uh, feelings related to it. But uh, this podcast is very different, you could say. And it, so that's one of the things to know right up front. It's like, say, wait a second, I don't get, when is this going to start? What are you doing? I say, give it a little bit of a chance, but you don't even have to give it a chance. If you're feeling skeptical or doubtful, that really is the most normal and healthy way to arrive at the show. Because maybe you were looking for something to fall asleep. You've tried a lot of other stuff or somebody told you about this show. So if you're skeptical or doubtful or or I don't know if that's what ambivalent is, but you're you're saying, hey, I'm not so sure about this. That's really, that totally makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't you be doubtful? And then I'm going to tell you stuff that's going to make you, you gotta, I get creaky dulcet tones and pointless meanders and superfluous tangents too. So the only advice I can tell you is what's worked for hundreds of thousands of listeners, which is give it a few tries and see how it goes. It takes the average listener uh, two or three times to get get used to the podcast and realize, oh, this never makes any sense. It's kind of uh, now I get that I don't get it. Uh, finally, oh, and now I know what a boar friend is. So just see how it goes. But I'm going to try to give you all the information you might need to, to do that, to overcome, not even to put your skepticism aside, to just lower it down a little bit. So let me give you that information. First off is the most important thing, which is you. You deserve a good night's sleep. And I'm here to attempt to do that. I won't successfully attempt to do it for a lot of people, but I'm here to attempt to do that because the truth is you really do deserve a good night's sleep. You really do do deserve some rest and a break. And if I can provide it, I would love to be the one that can help you make bedtime less of a rigmarole. 
and more something you feel neutral about or that you look forward to. You say, well, at least I got that sleep podcast that doesn't make any sense to listen to. So my boar friend, my boar bay, my boar bud, and I can listen to him. He just rambles on about almost, almost about nothing on and on and on. So, yeah, I could see how it goes. I could listen to that. Uh, but the reason is deeper than that. Like, I really want to help you get some rest so that you can live your life and that your life maybe will feel a little bit more manageable. Or maybe you could start getting more and more rest on a regular basis and you could be out there flourishing. That means your world's better. And that means the world that I live in is better. And that is important to me and everybody else listening. And it is the truth. You deserve a good night's sleep. And also the other side of it is I know how it feels. Tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble, getting, you know, thinking, all that stuff, feeling, I got it all. I got it all covered. So I know how it feels. That's why I call it the deep, dark night. That's one thing. The other thing that can, uh, there's two things. This is twofold. This is a podcast you really don't listen to. So if you're used to listening to podcasts or the radio or you watch stuff on YouTube, uh, this is more something that goes on in the background that you kind of tune in and out of. I guess that's like we do use a lot of stuff in that way, but we're less aware of it. And it's like there's more of a social compact. Somebody's making something where they're saying, watch, I'm going to give you the 10 reasons uh, to start, uh, you know, do it to tap dance. And they're really hoping you at least get like three out of five of the top 10. Reason one, because it's darn fun, probably. Reason two, maybe cardio. I don't know. I don't know what the other 10 or eight are. Another reason, probably because tap, maybe it sounds pretty good. Tap, tap, tap. And another reason, maybe some sort of tradition. I don't know. Uh, reason, another reason. Can, can I think of 10 reasons we should be tap dancing? I think I thought of four. Not just cardio. Five would be good for, you know, tone too. Uh, six, may, might make other people happy. Uh, seven, creative endeavor uh, that you put, you put your heart... Eight, uh, you do it. You can do it when it's raining outside, uh, and while you're singing, you can also sing and dance. Nine, uh, keeps you know tradition. Did I already say this one? You know, let's keep this tradition going. You know, somebody's got to make tap shoes and tap uh, tap tappers, or there's also a used market for them. And support your independent tap uh, tap shoe and tap providers, please. And number 10, uh, resiliency. Is you learning something new, growth mindset, always good for you. Good for the b- body, mind, and spirit. Th- that would have been, I should have just separated. Oh, this is a sleep podcast? Sorry about that. But if I was doing that and I had a YouTube channel, the tap, the tap, 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 I guess that would be hard to say. What's your favorite YouTube channel? Tap, 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 tap and ca- channel, cast channel. They talk about uh, a lot of different stuff, occasionally about tap dancing. It's not really about tap dancing and things interesting to tap dancers, like tap tap dance notes or tap notes. Uh, that's but it, it, it's it's a uh, it's actually just a tangent. A podcaster went on in his mind when he was trying to introduce his sleep podcast. So this is a podcast you don't really listen to. Just like you just heard, that was a, ta- a pointless meander tangent. And you say, oh, okay. It's also not a podcast that puts you to sleep. I'm here to keep you company while you fall asleep. So whether you're listening or not, I'm here for you. If you need to break during the day or you can't sleep, I'll be here to the very end. So those are two things. The other thing that can throw people off is the structure of the show. It's a very intentional and it serves a lot of purposes, but you could eventually kind of repurpose the show in your own way as you become a regular listener. Just because podcasts are sent out in a linear manner, so the show is designed in a linear way. But again, you could repurpose it or be a patron and kind of listen to it non-linearly. Learned a new word this week, linear. It means something like a straight line or something like that, or in a line. (laughs) I didn't learn what it meant, actually. I just pretended I learned what it meant. I learned how to use a word. I didn't necessarily know the exact meaning of it. 
It's on the Tapcast, Linear Tapping, Episode 1. So, okay, where were we? Oh, so the structure show. show starts off with a uh, greeting, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends beyond the binary. Or friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Then I say something silly. So hopefully you feel seen and you get the tone of the show. A little bit kind and a little bit silly. Then there's support for the show. There's support for listeners and there's support so the podcast can be free and come out twice a week. Uh, then there's the intro, and the intro kind of goes on and on and on, but it serves a purpose too, which is to give you like a, a middle place between when you were awake during the day and when you're asleep, uh, to give you like a a place to kind of meander and migrate yourself uh, in transition from your waking life to your sleeping life or wind down. And that's the way the majority of people use the show. It doesn't mean that it's wrong to use it another way. There's people that use the show in so many different ways. But for most people, they start playing the show while they're getting ready for bed, while they're doing some sort of relaxing wind-down activity, or they're just kind of winding down and sitting in bed or whatever. Uh, but there is like a small percentage of people that fall asleep during the intro, people that skip the intro, or people that listen to story-only episodes. So kind of see how it goes at first, but for me, that's really what works. I need an hour to wind down. Uh, you know, that's so I do different things to, to wind down so I can get a good night's sleep. And the intro kind of serves as a part of that for a lot of people. Uh, then after the intro is more business. That's, again, how the show can be free and twice a week. And have over 300 episodes you could choose from or listen to in a row or whatever. Then there'll be the story. Tonight's story, I think it's going to be a personal essay, but I'm not 100% positive because I'm going to record it later. And then there's thank yous at the end. So that's the structure of the show. That's why I make the show. I'm really glad you're here. And hopefully, uh, you know, I don't tap. I, I, hopefully I tap off into dreamland like a tap, a tap, a tap, a a tap cast, a uh, podcast, uh, things. That, oh, I already did that. That's from script notes. Uh, but it's called, it was called tap, a tap, a tap, a tap, a tap, a cast is better. Even though it's not better to say or to hear or to write down. If I was going to make a podcast. Anyway, I got to get out of here because I got to put you to sleep. I'm so glad you're here. I really appreciate your time. Thanks again for coming by. And here's a couple ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. All right, everybody, it's Scoots here. And uh, it's been a while since I've done a personal essay style episode or uh, one of those. And uh, I, I try not to, you know, I really try not to force things. But I've been, I give you a little background, a little sleepy background here and see where this goes. Uh, because I guess I've had some confluence of things. And who knows when you're listening to this, but when I'm recording it, it, it kind of plays into that. And I guess it'd be cool that I'll be editing this and you'll be listening to it in the future, which is another great opportunity to see how these growth opportunities go. Uh, so, so let me see, where are we at? So I've had, it's the fall of 2021. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I, I don't know what year it is and I know you probably don't either. And then even when I think it is, uh, then I say, probably not, that you can't be. But so to, to, to kind of practice more and more self-care and try different things out, I've tried to get back into journaling or morning pages or evening pages or inventory, whatever you want to call it. I'm trying to bookend my wind-down routine and my wake-up routine with some more, just trying to get a little bit more involved in my life uh, is it, with that, you know, in, in a, a way that just gives me some cornerstones and to try out. And also, to be honest, like, because it's, if, if you do have kids in your life, it has, like, to say, hey, this is what I'm doing, or we could do it together, side by side, parallel journaling. And we'll each keep our private business to our private business, but we could just do it at the same time as part of our wind down routine. 
because it's it, the fall of 2021, the autumn of 2021, I don't think it's an easy time for anybody, but particularly school children. But that doesn't mean, and I know it's, this can be something that I say, oh boy, I'm having strong feelings about this. And I say, yeah, this is an opportunity though, too. And I don't always view things that way. But I do have to say that then things, I started to realize some strange layers of stuff as I started journaling in a good way. And what I'm thinking we'll talk about, and maybe this will end up being a two-session show, I don't know, because I say, I don't know where this is, I really don't know where this is going to go, or if I have like 65, 70 minutes of stuff. Uh, so I'm trying to think where to start, but I guess where it starts is... Uh, well, yeah, like uh, the with the backstory of where I'm at now and why I'm thinking about this, uh, what it really comes down to is the hills of the East Bay and the South Bay in Northern California. And if you live in like Southern California or Central California, you probably have some of these hills. They may be a little bit different, you know, like, uh, in, you know, the, hill, the, gra- the, the grass that is not green can still always be greener because I do feel like I like the uh, hills and mountains around Los Angeles a little bit better, just a little bit more wild. But you do have to drive a little bit, you know, past Pasadena or whatever uh, or out in that direction. I I think I can't even remember anymore to get to those kind of hills. But these rolling undulating hills in California, and they're a bit different because that when it's raining in the winter, they turn green, which I guess is counterintuitive for the rest of the rest of everywhere else. And even for me, they have this rhythm, and then they turn brown, and they're brown for most of the like whenever the rain stops a little bit after that, and through the summer and into the autumn, which is kind of what our summer is here anyway. And then again, the cycle repeats itself in different ways, and and, and it's not something I really know a lot about, uh, like other than like when you drive east from Oakland or San Francisco, you'll start to see them, and in the further east you go until you get to the valley, like you'll see more and more of them, unless you go north or real far east into the mountains. These are the hills. I don't know if they're they're considered, I don't know if they're considered mountains. I don't really know. So, uh, what was my point here? I don't know what my point, do I have a point? <laughs> oh, so, so th- these hills, when you live here, they are something that you, or at least I kind of take for granted. And I've lived whatever in California for a while. And, but then you see them turn green and you say, oh, that's cool. And then they turn brown again. And the, and so the reason they have importance is twofold. Like right now, I have fallen deeply in love with these hills again uh, because of just some changes. But more so, the, the confluence is that these were the, this was the, literally uh, the first thing I saw when I got to California when I knew I was in California. So I'm trying to think what to explain first. I guess I'll explain the love, the current love first, and then we'll go back because then it'll be like looking at the onion and then maybe peeling the onion to say, well, there's probably something more here. And I I also, well, no, we'll go to the other layers. But, but so I've fallen in love with these hills, uh, and this is kind of a current personal essay type thing. I prefer the past ones because, like, uh, the boundaries are a little bit different than talking about my current circumstances. But so my current circumstances are that, uh, well, like, my routines changed, just like a lot of people changed. They changed going into the uh, 20, 2020, 2019, 2021 and then they changed coming out of them. So it's kind of been like this three-phase thing. Well, I kind of had my routine, and then and then I started to try to formulate a routine with my daughter learning from home, and now we're formulating a new routine with my daughter going to school. And she goes to school somewhere where we commute to school, 
And while she's at school, I work from like a co-working space on the days I drive her to school. Just because it's a reverse commute situation taking her to school. But if we were, if I was to try to go back home and work from home, not only would I have a double commute, uh, but then the, the commute would be like, it just, it just with traffic, it's just not achievable and only drive in one way. I drive her to school. Then I go to the co-working place and I work and then I go pick her up from school and we go home. Uh, but that's kind of also changed around some of the production of the podcast because I can't record episodes, at least as a, when I'm recording this at the co-working space, because it's just a, a, an office setting and it's not quiet and there's not a podcast studio there. And I don't know if I'd be comfortable, like, I don't know if that would necessarily work. Uh, so we'll see. But it, things are working fine on the production thing. It's just it changes, right? And... I guess it's good to, maybe it just, it is good for me to talk about this, even though it's outside of my comfort zone. Cause I see sometimes when I talk about my life in current circumstances, I feel like the boundaries become blurry or impact people in a way because I fall out of line of like how they imagine things or whatever around the podcast. And then sometimes I have to renegotiate those boundaries with the list, certain listeners or people take exception to it or whatever. So so I'm just putting that out there because I say, well, I'm still trying to be vulnerable, not in a like in a way to say, hey, it's okay. If you if you're having trouble with me talking about this stuff, you could listen to another episode, but more with this world stuff of trying to navigate it, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the difficulty or whatever, but it's like, okay, I don't always view this stuff or wholly view it as opportunities for growth or exploration. But I also want you to know that some tiny part of me, probably because of the podcast, I made positive interactions with all the listeners and the examples you said that it's like I've grown a little bit where I say, okay, these changes are good. So that set up one change, right? And we've gotten kind of into a rhythm. And then I said, okay, well... Probably after we get back from school, like is when I would record some intros like uh, or some pickups where normally I would record those if I was working from home for a full day during the day. And then when I'm at the co-working space, I do have I haven't gotten a routine down for the week, but like where I'm able to focus a lot more on production, writing and all of the, like a lot of the logistical stuff that you just got to sit and focus at a desk anyway to get done for the podcast. So I foresee once I get adjusted to this, like one day it being more like, okay, these are my focus office days and these are more of my production days, uh, but we'll see. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how things uh I mean, that would be interesting if I fall back into a routine where I'm like recording twice a day in two separate sessions, but I don't necessarily see that happening yet. Uh, also, a lot of this is about self care, right? And, and I've talked about running before. And if you ever want a memoir about running, I know the oatmeal has a lot of, a lot of them, but also what I talk about when I talk about running which I'm probably misquoting by Murakami is a great, uh, memoir about writing and running. So, okay. So, but so I, I loathe running. Like I've talked, I guess I didn't think this would be like a running podcast uh, about running, but this will go into a whole nother thing of California. So, but running is something or jogging, you'd say, that uh, since I discovered podcasts before I even started making sleep with me, particularly script notes and some deep dive theme park podcasts, those got me back into running because I was able to, and I've talked about this or I talk about it in interviews a lot too. Like there's something about that very similar and that probably led to sleep with me that like normally if I was running, even if I'm like normally when I'm running, I, the one thing I don't want to think about is the fact that I'm running because for me, and I know there's a lot of mindful runners and mindfulness and running is a thing and I am paying attention, but I don't want to think if I start thinking about running and not being mindful of it, then I think I loathe this. Uh, how much longer do I have to do this? 
uh, and I can't really enjoy it because my thoughts are getting in the way, which is my own thing. But, but because I discover podcasts, uh, like I'm able to, so I still have, like, so I'll still have my thinking track going out of my brain unrelated to running. They could be, you know, whatever, my chattering brain, they could be chattering about anything. But then I also have a podcast going. Let's say it is Script Notes or Lentesta on a podcast. And I'm listening to that. I'm able to kind of listen to that. And then maybe my thoughts intrude on the podcast and I pause and I get distracted or I drift away. And then I go back to the podcast or I rewind. So what were John and Craig talking about? I better back it up because, uh, but so that enabled me to not think about that third thing. The fact that I'm running in whatever I'm exerting myself or, you know, just not getting my overthinking brain involved in that process, just distracting enough. And that's worked. I mean, there's been times I've taken breaks from running or, you know, every once in a while, you know, I get a little like uh, pull something and I take a break. And, you know, secretly, I'm afraid to say this, but I do enjoy running, even though there's part of me that loves it. I, I really do like it. And uh, I like being outside and I like being not not that I'm running. I'm not a fast runner, but like being having to be able to get to a certain distance at a certain pace that's not that fast, but being able to sustain, being able to jog for an hour, like enables you to kind of see stuff that walking you wouldn't get it, be able to see or enjoy stuff. So that was a tangent about running, but, 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 but it's an important tangent because I said to myself with my daughter saying, I said, okay, I'm trying to balance work and this is a part of my self care and almost a hobby is running or jogging. And she's going to school east of where we live. So there was one time I was trying, before I had the co-working space, I was working at libraries. And so there was two public libraries I had to choose from. So there was one time I drove to one of the public libraries and we dro- I drove through the hills that I was talking about. Uh, and I saw a couple parks and I realized, wow, there's a lot of trails on these hills. Uh, I'd like to start running. And then another day, I think I just got lost. Was I just lost or did I go looking? No, did I go running? Oh, no. So I said to myself, well, you know, why don't you go for your run like and time it so you finish your run at school pickup and you can leave your car at school pickup or, you know, in the parking lot or whatever. And, you know, then it's not necessarily the end of your work day, but you're not distracted by when are you going to run? Like, let's try that out. So I tested that out weeks ago, and I said, well, let me see how far from her school, if I can just run and find one of these random entrances to these hills, uh, a lot of which are run by the East Bay Parks District, which is amazing. And I don't really know the history of it, but if you go to the East Bay of California, like the hills between Oakland and San Leandro and Hayward— and then the de- that's a developed area. And then the next developed area, which would be kind of the, is it the 680 corridor, I'd call it. You have um, like uh, San Ramon, Dublin, Pleasanton, Walnut Creek, Concord. Like the hills between those are mostly parks, uh, like, like uh, which is really like a miracle now. And such a resource and a visionary resource in the sense of like, not only was it preservation, but it's also offers recreation and it offers like value that, you know, nowadays might get lost in the bottom line or like might become overvalued instead of of saying, wow, this actually serves a value that, you know, probably increases the home values and, you know, ideally, we'll build a lot more housing in California in the areas that are already developed. You know, we don't need to use these hills. And I don't think that'll change. I think they're protected because it's a resource, you know, even if you live in an apartment building, you, you, then you can enjoy the hills or whatever. Like me, like I don't have a house in the hills where I could just run out. It would be pretty sweet. But so, uh, let's see, where was I? So everybody gets to enjoy these parks. So I ran one day and I just kept running and I was going down side streets and 
then I found an entrance to this open space, they called it. Uh, and interestingly enough, it had a bike trail or bike and running trail, a horse trail, and then hiking and run trail running trails. Now, I was at the end of my run that day, so I just found the entrance and then I ran back to my car. And then since then, I've said, okay, well, I could park at the entrance to that and then run in the hills. And I don't know. I mean, right now it's still something new. So you all know what it's like at the beginning of a relationship when there's unexplored territory. But I am so in love with the, like running, trail running in these hills or trail or hiking because sometimes it's too steep for me to run or jog even. And I'm just really enjoying it. And it's also like uh, inland, so it's a hotter air, which I love running, like not in humidity, but like I can, uh, dry heat I actually do enjoy running in. Uh, I mean, not extreme dry heat, but, you know, 80s, 90s, I don't mind, like because it, it's if there's not a high humidity, I don't know. But I, I said there's something else here. Like, like as soon as I hit these hills uh, and I started running or jogging in them, and you're talking about uh, these same things. So very dry right now, dirt, uh, hard-packed dirt with uh, brown grass or, or no, well, a straw-colored grass. They'd say brown, but I'd say like a straw-colored grass. And there's some trees and stuff, but it's fairly barren. But oh, to me, it is so beautiful. Uh, and I think it is from growing up in such a different uh, uh, ecological environment. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But thus far, and I've only probably run in the hills like six times. So it is like this new thing for me. And I'm still getting to know how far I can run and still be back in time for school pickup, which one time I cl- cut it close. I was two minutes late. Uh, when you're and when your kid's at a new school, you know, two minutes late, the, like I said, oh, sorry, you know, I got caught, uh, like, mistimed things. But so I don't know. And there's not too many details about the running in the hills other than, uh, you know, I'd, one day I go right, one day I go left, one day I take this path, one day I take that one. Let's see where this goes, and then keep an eye on my time out, and then trying to say, okay, can I get back in the same amount of time I went out on? It, but again, and I don't know if you ever experienced this, but where you're touching something in a a, a sense, and you're saying. Why does this feel so electric? Why does this touch feel so electric to me? Uh, you know, like, and I guess for somebody like me that's an overthinker, you know, part of me would say you shouldn't be enjoying this so much or oh, you're delusional or whatever. L- like there is a part of me, a strong internal critic or cynic. Uh, but I still said, what is this uh, with these hills? I mean, it really isn't that big a deal. I, I mean, it is, though. I don't know, and it's not a traditional beauty like a lot of people would say. Well, these hills, they're just like uh, barren, uh, straw, grassy hills with some old gnarled trees. And I see, yeah, like a walnut tree I, I think I ran across the other day, and they're bleak. Like it's just dirt, hard-packed dirt, uh, and, you know, it's just sun, the sun's on it, and gnarled and I say oh boy yes you are right isn't that doesn't that make your heart palpitate so much but I still said what is it about these hills and and even talking to my journal about it I I said uh, you know well like I've been running with these hills and it's just I don't know it's really got me going and I can't quite put my finger on it uh, and like, uh, like, I mean, not to be like, I'm thirst in these hills, like, and so, uh, as then, like, as I was writing it out, I remembered, uh, that there is a, le- like, oh, what is the electric layer was when I moved to, to California and I'd never been to California before. That was the first thing I saw that I knew I was in California and I was actually incorrect in some sense. And so 
I was on the plane. I was taking a flight. I don't know where my layover was, but I flew into the San Jose Cal- Airport, San Jose, California Airport, which uh, over the past few years, uh, it, it had kind of grown in traffic. But it's a small, it, it, at the time, it was a smaller airport, but still jet, you know, still jets could land. And I was flying from Syracuse to California, but I had probably had one or two layovers. Maybe just one. Maybe there's flights from JFK or, or LaGuardia. But who knows? All I know is, like, uh, I love looking out the window of a plane, but at some point, like, I started to see these hills. And, and for someone from Syracuse, uh, I thought they were sand dunes, Uh and I said, holy mackerel, is it like, like uh, I really felt like uh, I was experiencing, it, it just, uh, like, my mind was blown. Like, seeing these sand dunes, or what I saw were these sand dunes, and just being like, holy, holy mackerel, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe these rolling hills. Like, it, it was uh, from someone that just grows up in a, uh, a much different environment, which, you know, now I go back there and I kind of have the, like, it really is powerful. Like I'm able to have that exact appreciation, like flying into an East coast city in the summer and seeing the trees retaining the humidity, uh, or flying in, in the, in the, in a starker time and seeing everything you can see. Cause there's no leaves on the trees. I really haven't gotten a lot of autumn travel back East in, but, or flying someplace that's in another different environment, like maybe Florida, uh, but like flying to the East coast, uh, the Northeast, uh, and, or flying into a city like New York or Philly and then seeing like the combination of the green and the, the the heat on the cities, oh boy. And then being on the ground and, and going for hikes or walks and those type of things, which is a mix of kind of, uh, what do you call them, evergreen and deciduous trees uh, and feeling that humidity, a whole nother romance. Uh, but so I remember my plane landed and, and I, I can't, it's interesting, you know, you have these powerful moments that are a little bit misty, right? Uh, where a new part, like you're, you're taking a new part of your life. And maybe also this is coming up because my daughter is experiencing it in a different way. She's a freshman in high school, right? But so, uh, like I'm on this plane and I can just remember looking out the window and seeing these hills and thinking that this must have been like where they shot like movies that took place in deserts, which I can't even think of one. I think there was some like action type, uh, drama type movie, but I don't even know. Like I said, is this, these are like the sand dunes you see in movies like that people get to ski down and, 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 and no, they were not. And then just no, like it was hot because this was August, uh, and San Jose gets pretty hot. Uh, it can get pretty hot. Uh, like I got off the plane, it was hot. And, and I mean, I did not know anything. I knew very little about California other than San Francisco and Los Angeles and a little bit more. That was the limits of my knowledge. And I, like I said, I'd never been there before. So I was thinking that San Jose, like I was like, this must be one of these desert regions of California, which it was incorrect. And I guess part of my brain didn't quite put together that San Francisco was just like, a, you know, 30 miles away or something. And so I got off the plane. Like I said, it was hot. Uh, now, this is where my memory gets a little bit foggy. And it's weird that the mostly other than these uh, feelings of uh, mesmerize, mesmerizing, I can't really tap into the other feelings because I'm sure I was feeling some other strong feelings because I was go- going there. And, and I'll talk, talk a little bit more about it, but uh, but whatever. Let me get this hill stuff out while we were here. So I get off the plane and I presume it's daytime. So my best guess is that I left early in the morning on the East Coast, which would make sense because even now when I visit Syracuse, 
yeah, there's not a lot of flight options. Like this past time, luckily there was like a like a twelve o'clock or an eleven o'clock midday flight. Uh, but usually, in the in, in normally, there's only like very early. You're talking like six in the morning flights to connect to a flight to the west coast or late afternoon flights that then don't get in till really late, like one in the morning. But somehow this year, with because it also I had to change my ticket so much of times, but uh, I was able to get some flight that left at a reasonable time. Like I think it was like around ten thirty or eleven. And then, you know, whatever, went to one of the hubs, Detroit or Atlanta, normally. And then I was able to get home at a reasonable time, like 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I think it was, yeah, like 6 or 7 o'clock. Okay, so here's, so I land in San Jose. I get off the plane. I think, like, uh, and probably somebody had coached me through this, but I'm pretty sure this was back in the, like, so I had a hotel booked near the airport. And I'm pretty sure this, like, almost never happened to me ever again. Uh, but I'm pretty sure what happened was, like, this was back when, like, ho- all the hotels had free shuttles. Any airport hotel also had a free shuttle that would pick you up at the airport because it wasn't close enough to the airport to walk. and. I'm actually not, now I'm like 99% positive because I can kind of remember walking up and I think a lot of times they had like a, a dedicated kind of phone booth for it where you just press one button and it calls a hotel and you say, hey, I'm here in the San Jose airport. I need you to pick me up. And this, I think, I'm pretty sure it was a Holiday Inn, but just at least in my mind, that's what it was, like a Holiday Inn type motel. I don't think, well, maybe it was a, oh, oh boy, we're getting more information coming here. I think so. So I get to a hotel shuttle, and I'm pretty sure it was, it was daytime, because I don't think I stayed more than one night. I think I only stayed one night at this place. So I went to the hotel, and we'll just pretend it's a Holiday Inn. And I checked in, and again, I said, holy cow, like, uh, like, let me get, get out. And, uh, and I, you know, went to my room, and I knew I had to be somewhere the next morning, I think. Uh, but so I got settled. I don't really remember, I literally remember nothing about the room at all. Uh, but I know it had an outdoor pool and I went swimming because I love swimming and it was so hot. Uh, so I don't know if I swam right away or I went swimming. Uh, and so this hotel was also the recommended hotel, I think, for the people that were doing this, which was like a, vo- a year long volunteer program. So I think part of me was the social nervous part of me. Uh, and lo- like loner, like I have my loner part of me cause I like to be alone sometimes, but there's also the forlorn loner, uh, or the outsider type part of me. And so I don't know if there was like other people my age at the pool or if I was wondering like, w- like, uh, like, or whatever. But so I, I know I went swimming. I'm not sure if I went swimming first or last. And the only other thing I knew I did which is so me, like for nowadays, but I guess I had gone to college in New York too, so it made sense, is I went for a walk. Uh, And if this, like, so this was not in downtown San Jose. So this was like somewhere out, uh, actually San Jose Airport though is somewhat near downtown San Jose. And I don't think I, maybe I asked at the front desk, like where is there someplace I could go eat? Uh, Or maybe I didn't, I just started walking, but I like walked and I got to like a boulevard that you would expect by not far from an airport where hotels and motels are. Maybe it was the same boulevard the hotel was on and it just had like offices and fast food places. And this was either a Saturday or a Sunday and so then I uh, went to a Togo's. and the reason I'm laughing is uh, um, is that uh, my relationship, it just uh, like I didn't know that it was a chain. And again, I had moved from like a place uh, 
that, uh, like in, 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 in this was pre sub Togo's, I think it was pre subway or maybe subway was around at this point. But, uh, if you were going to eat at a chain deli in New York city, you would usually eat at a blimpies. And if you were eating at a chain deli in Syracuse, you would usually eat at Drex subs. And otherwise, you could go to the Brooklyn Pickle or in New York City, you know, you could take your pick of like independent delis. Uh, in all of those places, even Blimpies or Drex subs, they make a similar sub sandwiches. And I know some people have ogies and grinders and Adam Sandler has a song about it, but uh, those are made a certain way. And so I had like a kind of East Coast sandwich sensibility, and I still do. I had a sub at an independent sub shop this summer, and it was an East Coast sub. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, Subway attempted to uh, copy that, but not not successfully. No offense. Uh, but, they, you know, they did a good enough job. And Togo's is not like that. Uh, it's... Uh, and I don't quite know how to put my finger on the difference, but that, uh, so I remember ordering the sub and eating it and kind of being satiated and probably drinking some lemonade or soda. And I just remember that. Well, and the reason I was laughing again also is because, so for a long time, I worked somewhere in a building that that was on like the second floor or even outside, like in this building, it was a reconverted uh, uh, factory to like offices and stuff. And then on the ground floor was a Home Depot. I think there was a Walmart that had a Mickey D's in there. There was a cell phone store and maybe one or two other things. And then a to I think Togo's was like literally the only place. You so if I forgot to bring my lunch to work uh, and I didn't want to drive somewhere, which I didn't want to do ever to go get my lunch, my option was Togo's or um, I think Mickey D's, which you just can't. I mean, come on. I mean, occasionally like inside of Walmart. So I grew to have a contentious relationship with Togo's because it just was one of those places where it was like, uh, did its job, but nothing ever, I never had like, oh boy, I got to go to Togo's and get that wild, wild ones sandwich pack. It was more like, well, at least I could fill up on the sun chips and then whatever, I'll have the turkey or the tuna or whatever they got going. So I didn't mean, I guess I, I'm not mean, that's just my personal taste either. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You know, if you love to Togo's or if you work there, that's, that's cool. I mean, uh, I told like you probably people love it. And it was the first place I ever ate. In, here's here. You, there you go. First place I ever ate in California, Togo's. And while I was at Togo's, was, that's when I got a little bit closer view of these hills. And I was proud. I mean, this part was a little bit like a, sl like a boring sleep with me movie where I was like that kid, like walking down. I mean, this is why I say boring sleep with me because I'm walking like through office park style area from a holiday in looking at these hills, realizing there's grass on the hills, but still like the un undulation of these hills. Uh, it just, it just, it just struck me. It was just, uh, it was romantic in a way like I was talking about earlier that I'm feeling about it now, that's not traditionally romantic. Uh, like sure, California. I mean, I got to move to LA and that now the hills around LA or the Los Angeles national forest uh, or the Angeles national forest, there's some romance. And then you go further, you know, into the, the mountains of the Sierras and stuff like, holy mackerel. These hills are not like, uh, that flashy, uh, even if you go into some of the East Bay, the Redwood areas, like these hills are more undulating hills with with uh, straw-like grass. But there was just something about it. And maybe it's just seared to that new memory. And then I walked back to the Holiday Inn, and uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't do anything. I, I don't know, maybe I, like... Uh, Maybe I did something, but at some point I met two other gentlemen 
or boy, men, boys, I don't know, guys that were doing this volunteer program that knew each other. And I don't know if I met him at that night or during the day. And one of them was a little bit more outgoing. And he said, hey, are you uh, in, in this JVC program? And I said, yeah. And, and then he said, oh, come back to our room. I'm pretty sure I came back to the room like the morning we were supposed to take the airport shuttle back to the airport. And that's where our journey started. But let me back up again. And I kind of talked about this a long time ago in uh, another podcast. So, but again, hopefully this like, maybe this is some new territory. And if you're listening, you know, maybe you're sound asleep looking so good and that's great. But if you are here along with me and, and you're here for me to keep you company, maybe it could help make some of this normal because this is what old scoots went, goes through all the time. But so this goes back to like college and I graduated college or I was graduating and I did not know what I needed to do, what I was going to do. Like I knew what I wanted to do with my life, which was to make movies. But that didn't seem possible. And at the time I was probably, you know, some of my underlying issues, you know, I got sober much later after this, but I probably... Like that was impacting my decision making, my relationship with alcohol, and my relationship with fear, which those two are in a, inexorably linked. Uh, so I thought, like, and this was, well, it's not mistaken because my life took the journey it took, but I think if I was more in a more stable or confident or comfortable place, I probably would have stayed in New York, like, which is what most of my friends did. Oh, because I went to college in the Bronx and Fordham in New York City. And like a, like a, some of my friends got job offers when they were in college or they were recruiting or they were like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And they kind of like started to kind of figure out who's going to live with who or whom. And I was like, uh, I had the old... Uh, uh, the hot foot, right? Like they call it, like, I think I thought I was going to get some geographic cure. Like I said, okay, well, but I also was like, just lost. I said, I don't know what I want to do. I know I don't want to get, I know I don't have good boundaries. And if I just get some job, like, uh, working in the office, I'll get stuck. Uh, at least I had that foresight because you could easily get like a job, like, there's just a lot of companies. I mean, I think they were all companies that were hiring people based on, like, uh, selling something or whatever. So it wouldn't have worked out anyway. But it's, so, but I said, no, 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 I can't just get a job. And, and I didn't have any money. So it's like, I, I, I kind of got to figure out a job to stay in New York. Uh, and I just had a sense of half what I said, oh, no, 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 I got to get out of here. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I guess when you talk about synchronicity with these hills, uh, there's also other forms of synchronicity because I'll never forget it. Uh, um, I, I don't know if this was like what part of my senior year this was, but they had this volunteer career fair, or volunteer opportunity fair or something. And I think one or two people that I knew said, hey, well, I'm going to go check this out. And maybe I went, maybe I liked somebody and, and they were going or what, but I, I like went to this, uh, and, uh, I found two different organizations, well, three, but two that I was like very strongly interested in. And I didn't even realize this was an option. It was like, oh, you could do a year of service after you graduate, uh, and that's what you'll do for a year. And there was one, and it had just kind of, it, w it was having trouble with funding because of, like, politics-type stuff. Uh, but it's still around now, which is AmeriCorps. And they had, like, th these two different kinds of AmeriCorps. Like, uh, they had, like, this one AmeriCorps that was responding to stuff. And I thought, wow, like, when major events happen, th I don't know if this program's still in place, but... Uh, like AmeriCorps is like a direct service thing. Like you go like teach for America was another one that was there, but I don't, I didn't think I wanted to be a teacher. And I remember actually maybe one of the guys I went for, he did teach for America. I think that's what it's called. And you just you volunteer and you teach for a year. And I think now he's a principal somewhere. But so, 
um, like uh, I said, oh, okay, well, I don't want to do Teach for America because I don't see, <laughs> which is ironic. Uh, I don't see myself being a teacher. And so, but so I saw this AmeriCorps thing. I said, okay, they said, yeah, we kind of have these two things going right now. Maybe they were called different things at the time, but we had like regular AmeriCorps, which you go do something and, uh, like, uh, like, you, you know, whatever, like similar to Teach for America, you go work on, in direct service with people in need. And I said, okay, that sounds cool. And then they said, we have this other one, but it doesn't have funding right now. If funding got cut, we're trying to get it back restored. And it's more physical, like that. And probably now they have like something like the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was similar to that where it wasn't necessarily all like fixing trails and anything, it was like, oh, if uh, some strong weather goes somewhere, these volunteers would go there and help. And I said, that would be cool. So they said, well, okay, well, here's how you apply to all of it. Uh, so I saw that one. Then I saw another one. What did I say? There was three. There might have been one other, like, uh, organization I can't think of. Uh, but so there was this other organization there called JVC, which stands for Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And JVC was, uh, like, b- b- like based in a Jesuit tradition, and it, it was a little bit more mission-based, where AmeriCorps was, like, a, like a non-secular. JVC was, in, or JVC is not necessarily a Catholic. I mean, even though it has a Jesuit backing, it was rooted in this fourfold mission, which was spirituality, like, which you could de- define how you wanted, uh social justice, simplicity, and community. And uh, it had this fourfold of values. And I said, okay, and and yeah, again, you go work in direct service. A lot of the direct service was either, you know, not social work because you weren't a social worker, but working with social workers or teaching. And they said it's a little bit harder to get into, you know, we, we, we like screen people or whatever. And uh, but they said, here's how to apply. And I said, holy cow, like this might this might be for me, like uh, one of these two things. And the more I kind of discerned about it, ironically, when you talk about Jesuits and stuff like uh, I said, I, I really think uh, you know, I want to do one of these. And at the time, the. Uh, the the response AmeriCorps was like my top choice, uh, and so whatever I filled out the applications and uh, my timeline is very confusing because I have no idea, like if this happened after I graduated college or I think it, the JVC probably timeline was probably yeah like you apply for it and then you know get accepted till after you graduate college I'm not sure about that though. Was there was some uncertainty, and the, the AmeriCorps one was definitely uncertain. Like, they were like, you can apply, uh, but at the time, even the AmeriCorps overall, they were like, we might lose funding just because there was different different group, different group uh, parties in charge of each part of the government, and they weren't getting along. So they were like, we, we might not have any funding for this at all, but we definitely are having trouble getting the funding for this. This is just how I remember it, too. might not be true. And so I said, okay, that I guess will be my first choice, but I, I'll apply to this JVC, too, because it sounds pretty cool and uh, sounds maybe a little bit too intense for me, like the idea of the spirituality but I said, it appeals to me, like the idea of social justice, you know, because I moved from someone that was more ignorant, right, and more close-minded, and I didn't really understand uh, how the world was for everybody. And as I became more aware of that, I did say, wait a second, there is this social injustice that I see, uh, you know, now that I've gotten outside of my bubble, and it did become more and more important to me the more time I spent, uh, you know, I, I think that's part of like a Jesuit education or even a liberal arts education. Sometimes you say, oh, OK, whoa, like I really was an ignorant, privileged person and still am. But but as my like as I started to realize more of that, I said, wait a second, like maybe I do need to be a part of change here. Or I'm not comfortable with this. Uh, what can I do about it? 
And so JVC did offer an opportunity to engage with that and say, well, if this is important to you, uh, simplicity, social justice, spirituality, and community, uh, you know, think about applying. And so then I applied for JVC. And the only things I really remember about it is, uh, I don't know if it's after you get in or when you apply. I think when you apply, back then when I applied, you applied to a region. So there was like the United States was broken up into like uh, one, two, three, four, like five or six regions, like the Northeast, uh, the Southeast, uh, the the South, mid Middle South, like so, maybe the South, uh, but then included like Texas and everything. So the, and then the Midwest, the Northwest, and the Southwest. So I applied to JVC SW Southwest. And because I said, well, if I could, like, if I'm going to do this, like, why not do it somewhere that's like, uh, like I could live in California or Arizona. And I think at the time I had like this, uh, also this uh, romantic view of not just California, but of Arizona as well. I think at the time I was like, would have been happy to be in California or Arizona. And then uh, you had to apply, for, then you had to pick, I think they gave you a list of locations and jobs and you had to like rank your top 10 or your top five. And then you had to, you know, apply for the jobs, like based on your experience. And a lot of the jobs were teaching, which was a bit of a bummer for me because I was kind of like, I just didn't see myself as a teacher but I think I did like put some Arizona teaching jobs high and then, uh, then Los Angeles was like my second choice. Uh, like, and then after that, maybe San Diego, I, I wasn't like, I didn't have as much, like I had more glamor for Los Angeles than San Francisco at the time. Even though like, as a kid, I talked about how I like was obsessed with San Francisco when I was in grammar school. And so I applied, and then I remember having an interview call with this guy, Mike, and he was very uh, animated and sounded pretty relaxed. Uh, and, like, uh, he said, okay, well, like, tell me about yourself. It was more of, like, an informational, whatever you call it, interview to kind of see how you'd handle things socially and things well outside of your comfort zone. And then I found out I got in, and then I found out I got placed in uh, East Los Angeles at Our Lady of Guadalupe School. And that is where I would be a second grade teacher's aide and a boys' PE teacher and coach, uh, none of which I was qualified. Second grade teacher's aide, I was pretty uh, qualified to do. And also I was in the capable hands of, uh, Mrs. T. Uh, so she was, uh, Florencia, she was the best. And, uh, and I got, so, oh, okay. So back up as we close out here. So I got to, we, I was at the thing. I saw the beautiful Hills, went to Togo's, met these two guys. I was definitely outside. Then I started getting outside my comfort zone. Then we had to go get a bus, uh, and I think it was a school bus, and to go, we were going to go on like a training retreat. Uh, and I remember our bus broke down going over the Santa Cruz Mountains, and I don't, I can't remember who I sat with. I think I can kind of barely remember, uh, like sitting with a couple people and I was very, very socially feeling those strong feelings. And eventually we got to, uh, the retreat center and then it was, uh, it was in, uh, Aptos, California, like on the coast. And now the Northern California coast is much different than the Southern California coast. So I don't know if we swam, but I remember hanging out on the beach, uh, and there was people that were like a little bit more, uh, like socially interactive than me. And then I met my future roommates. Uh, cause you live in community, you live in the community you serve and then in a community of other volunteers. And I met all my roommates and I said, okay, well, like, this seems to like, we, we all seemed to, to get along. Uh, and there was three women and one other male and, 
uh, we kind of connected and then I said, okay, well, at least now I know some people and I'm trying to think how, what else, how else everything, uh, planned out. Uh, then we had to kind of retreat and training and we kind of got to know our, our community members and then kind of got more comfortable and kind of got trained in mostly like how do you deal with as a graduate of school, like going to a new job that's going to be pretty intense. And that was the most important, powerful thing was like, just remember, this is going to be really hard. And your first few weeks are going to be really, really hard living in community. Also, we were supposed to be living sim- simply, which meant we had a very limited budget, uh, like our housing was paid for and our utilities, and then we got a small stipend to spend and then a small stipend for food and stuff. And they said, you just kind of let yourself, you're not going to be good at your job, and it's you know, you're know you going to have to learn, like you'll slowly learn. So give yourself permission to have some really hard days at work. Uh, sorry, I, I get distracted. And then, oh, so we had a simple budget, so believe it or not, like uh, we were actually able to eat really well. I think we were each given $75 a month uh, for food, and we kind of pooled that among the five of us and took turns cooking. I did get lunch at my job, though, because uh, we all the teachers, that was a great thing. Just just happened to be with my job, but uh, we would, uh, the mother of the parish priest would cook lunch for the teachers every day. So we'd have like a teacher's meeting every day and eat lunch, which was absolutely amazing. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just been on my mind, I guess, with changes lately, but just the hills and how it's kind of reconnected me. And it's just strange to kind of fall in love with something again that not many people probably fall in love with. And then why do I love this so much? And I say, oh, well, I love it because of what it is, but also because I am I was already connected to it. Uh, so if you're wondering where I am, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably not. But at some point you could see me slowly, oh, so slowly, jogging on that path, listening to a podcast, and really like enjoying the dirt and the heat uh, and the dust kicking up. Uh, not too dusty though, and the grass and the views of those rolling straw colored hills. Uh, so glad to be back in your arms. Good night. All right, everybody. I want to thank everybody that signed up for a referral program in the last couple months. Uh, you could do that at com slash refers. And to some of the people that are really bringing in the referrals, I want to thank uh, the people who just signed up. Faith, uh, Tanya, and Morgan, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Tyra, Lorinda, and Rowan, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Uh, Melena, Anna, and Tom, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Rebecca, Allie, and Sherry, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Maggie, Stacy, and Ashley, thank you. Thanks, 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 and good night. Tiffany, Holly, and Lauren, thank you. Thanks, 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 and good night. Uh, Will, Maids, and Kim, thank you. Thanks, 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 and good night. Charlotte, Alicia, and Jack, thanks, 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 and good night. Uh, Cy, Charlie, and Maria, thank you. Thanks, 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 and good night. And Kimberly, Anita, and Alana, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Uh, Julie, Leslie, and Stephanie, thank you, thanks, thanks, and good night. Jay, Jill, and Ziggy, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Keith, Aaron, and Sebastian, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Rachel, Annalise, and Amy, thank you, thanks, thanks, and good night. Haley, Vanessa, and Maganda, thank you, thanks, 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 and good night. Bastian, uh, Katie, and Mika, thank you, thanks, thanks, and good night. And one of the people that got some referrals in the past couple of months, uh, Mika, Haley, uh, Keith, uh, Ziggy, holy moly. Ziggy uh, shared the podcast 37 times, got 15 referrals. 
Uh, let's see who else here has been bringing them in. Maids has got a referral. Maggie, 46 shares, is seven referrals. Uh, Rowan, five uh, shares, two referrals. Uh, some people, you know, you got to share it. Uh, like I said, Maggie, 46 times. Uh, Ziggy, 37 times. Keith, 14. Uh, let's dig a little bit deeper here. What else we got? Uh, Marigold, uh, who signed up a while ago, 22 shares and bringing in some referrals. Uh, Katie, 24 shares and bringing in some referrals. Uh, Eden's got a referral. Debbie's got three referrals from 10 shares. Lorette's got 15 shares and four referrals. Uh, Caroline's got a referral. Lisa's got a referral. Anna's got a referral. Alice, 39 shares and getting some referrals. Tanya, 38 shares and nine referrals. Wow. Uh, and just to show how high, those are the people that are newer. Uh, you know, our leaderboard here, uh, let me just see the number. Cornelia has uh, 3,390 shares and 428 referrals, which is just absolutely amazing. So thank you, thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks, thanks, and good night.